Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Who We Are podcast. I am so glad to have you here with me today. Whether you're tuning in from your morning commute, closing up at home with a cup of tea or at your work desk or maybe even just taking a quiet moment for yourself, wherever you are, thank you for being a part of this journey with me. We have reached our 21st episode for this second season today and 21 happens to be my favourite number. I wanted to take this opportunity to pause, breathe and just check in with you and also to share what's been on my heart lately. I think it's easy to get caught up in the hustle and bustle of life but today I wanted to slow things down a little bit and have an intimate chat with you, just you and me. Over the past episodes, we have had some really amazing conversations with thought leaders, experts and everyday inspiring individuals. And those moments have deeply impacted me. They've expanded my consciousness, shaped the way I see the world and the way I approach my own life. Today, I want to turn inward a little bit to reflect on what this journey has meant to me and also share some lessons, thoughts and reflections. So grab your favourite drink, settle in and let's have a heart to heart. This is a space where we can be real, where we can explore what it means to grow, to evolve and to discover who we really are. And as always, I hope that in sharing my journey, it inspires you to reflect on your own too. So once again, thank you for being here, for listening and for sharing this moment with me. So I'm going to be answering some of your questions. I think a couple of weeks ago, I polled on Instagram stories uh, to ask you if you have any questions for me. And so many of you actually submitted really deep and big questions. But for today, I picked up uh, also some questions uh, that, you know, I can address and answer and also share my thoughts around. So let's go. So the first one, what does reaching the 21st episode of season 2 mean to you? Wow, when I first started this podcast, it was really about exploring what it truly means to know ourselves our dreams, our fears, our essence. And reaching the 21st episode of this season feels like such a personal milestone to me. I knew that I wanted to have meaningful conversations that would resonate with you and with myself as well. And this journey has been one of discovery, not just through the guests that I've had the privilege uh, of speaking with, but also in learning about myself along the way. Every episode has really pushed me to reflect deeper, to question the stories I tell myself, and to grow. I've also realized that the most important conversations we have are the ones that really challenge us to see things differently. And here we are, 21 episodes in, still growing and still learning together. Well, on to the next question. How has the podcast impacted you personally? Wow. The podcast and its conversations have really been a deeply transformative experience for me. It's provided a space for introspection, allowing me to explore questions I actually didn't realize that I needed to ask myself. They've also provided me with many tangible steps and action to become a better version of myself in the different aspects of my life. So maybe to share just some of my favorite takeaways so far, you know, from the past episodes is maybe let's start with Robin Sharma. Uh, my key takeaway from that episode that I've also applied in my daily life is when he talked about embracing micro bravery. And that was really you know about the deliberate discomfort and Robin Sharma says you know deliberate discomfort is really about intentionally facing small fears and challenges on a regular basis this practice which he calls micro bravery really involves stepping outside of my comfort zone in manageable small ways and he says you know in doing so we build resilience and gradually expand our capabilities as well so one example of micro bravery that's been significant in my own life is which is something that I'm working on now, learning to say no and learning to set boundaries. This may sound simple, but it's actually something I've struggled with, especially when it comes to managing my commitments and energy levels. For a long time, I found it difficult to say no. I would 
often take on more than I could handle because I wanted to accommodate everyone's needs and desires. To tackle this, you know, and also inspired by Robin Sharma's microbrewery and deliberate discomfort, uh, I began by saying no to just one seemingly small request each week, like turning down an invitation to a social event that I felt like I didn't have any time or energy for. Uh, it felt really uncomfortable at first, but with each small act of bravery, I gained more confidence. And along the way, these small acts of saying no became easier. Uh, and I noticed a significant shift in my life. I felt like I could reclaim my time, my energy, my personal space. And this has also allowed me to focus on what truly matters and maintain a healthier, balanced and more fulfilled life. This practice of deliberate discomfort, though small in its steps, has really been incredibly powerful for me and, and, and truly I believe it's been a testament to how embracing micro-bravery in everyday decisions can lead to personal growth and a more fulfilling life. And another favourite takeaway is actually from James Sexton. He is the top divorce attorney in America. And I really, really enjoyed this conversation. You know, there are some speakers who are great authors. And then there are those that are exceptional teachers. I feel, in my opinion, James Sexton stands out as both. He is highly intelligent, engaging, captivating and he was able to deliver his points with such remarkable clarity and compelling analogies. I felt like, you know, his ability to convey complex ideas so convincingly and beautifully is truly impressive and I really thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. So some of my key takeaways from that conversation was, you know, maybe around three sub-points. The first one which he spoke a lot about which was attention to detail and his analogy was around gaining weight and he said we don't become obese overnight so just as small dietary choices affect our weight the little things we do each day play a crucial role in the health of our marriage and I found that you know paying attention to these details like acknowledging what Leo is doing for me and the family or simply just checking in and asking how his day went makes a significant difference. It's this small and seemingly insignificant interactions that really contribute to our happiness and strengthen our bond. Another takeaway from James Sexton was the point on consistency. So again, to his analogy on maintaining and gaining weight, maintaining a healthy weight requires consistent effort and likewise, nurturing our marriage is no different. We have learned that small daily actions can either build us up or create distance between us. So for instance, you know, Leo and I, we really try to set aside time each week for a weekly check-in one-on-one where it's just the both of us and it's just undivided attention. This consistency really helps us to stay in tune with each other, what we're going through, what we're struggling with, any feedback that we need or requests that we need to give each other and really keeps our relationship vibrant. Uh, it's this really regular intentional acts of connection that make all the difference over time. And I think the last uh, key takeaway from James Saxon for me was the point where he talked about the accumulation of neglect. So James Saxon shares that problems in marriage don't usually appear overnight. They actually build up slowly and when we neglect to address the small issues. I remember times when maybe Leo and I allowed minor disagreements to fester uh, and we neglected checking in with each other. Over time, this neglect accumulated and led to unnecessary tension and friction. And learning from this reminder from James as well, we've become more proactive about addressing small concerns before they become major issues. And that's why going back to the point earlier on that sacred time each week to really check in with each other because that's when we also talk through issues that perhaps are bothering us as well. And so by being attentive and addressing small problems early on, we prevent them from snowballing into something more serious. Another takeaway, you know, from my guest this season was also from Karen Tay, right? Um, and Karen, as we know, uh, she used to work in the government and policy making and she shared a lot about the notion 
of this idea of you know having it all and is it really something attainable and what does it even mean to have it all and why we should embrace perhaps not having it all and one of my key takeaways from Karen was really when she shared about viewing life as a series of hypotheses I think this concept for me of viewing life as a series of hypotheses rather than definitive tests can be truly transformative. This perspective offers, I think, such a refreshing approach to how we make decisions and face challenges in our lives. It really encouraged me to embrace experimentation in my daily choices and to see every outcome as a valuable learning experience rather than a final judgment on my capability or worth. Uh, this has also really helped cultivate a continuous learning attitude for me to take on and to know that each life choice in each season of my life, be it a career move, a personal relationship, or even smaller daily decisions, then becomes a chance to gather insights about what works and what doesn't work. I also learned to value the process over the outcome, which can lead to more creative and innovative ways of thinking and living. And the other one is also Janice Cole, which I also shared most recently in one of my Instagram reels, where, you know, she shared something that really got me thinking more deeply uh, during this season of my life as a mom to two young kids. And Janice shared that when her kids were growing up, she's often had to be away from home for work, filming, rehearsals and everything, right? And she shared, looking back now, one of the things that she wished she could do more is to be more present with her kids in their day-to-day -day lives. She shared this phrase and she said, you know, people always talk about quality time over quantity time. But there's something to be said about quantity time. And I think that's also something that I've been reflecting a lot in my journey uh, and, you know, rethinking how I really want to spend my time and how present I really am with Ollie and Kira. So moving on to the next question. What reflections do you have on the year 2024 so far? Well, firstly, I can't believe uh, that we're almost into September and time really, really flies. I think one of the key things that I have been deeply reflecting on and really working on is about how I can improve the way I can communicate with the people around me uh, like my team, Dion and Leo, especially in terms of over communicating, even when things aren't fully defined. It's something I've come to realise is crucial and not just for the sake of clarity but also for building trust and assurance with my team my family, and even within myself. And as I've also been reflecting on incidents that have happened recently, I've realised that there have been a few instances where misunderstandings, unhappiness, friction and tension have arisen, not because of the challenges themselves, but because I didn't communicate early enough. It's something that's been on my mind a lot and it's taught me a valuable lesson about the importance of staying connected, even when things aren't fully clear. In those moments, I hesitated to speak up or to just share because I didn't have the answers yet. I wanted to wait until I could present a complete picture to offer something definitive. But looking back and you know reflecting on how I can do better and learn, I see now that this silence actually created more uncertainty and stress for everyone involved. The absence of communication uh, left a lot of room for assumptions, doubt, and the kind of unclarity that can strain relationships. I've come to understand that it's not always about having everything figured out before we speak up. Sometimes it's really about keeping the lines of communication open. And even when all I can say is, I'm still working on this, and here's where we are right now. I feel like it's about letting others in on the process, sharing what I do know, and being transparent about what I'm still figuring out. So I've learned that frequent communication, open communication, transparent communication uh, can prevent so many of these misunderstandings. And it also would reassure those around me that, hey, they're not in the dark, and that they're part of the journey, and that their concerns are being heard. So I think that's something that I'm working on also to build trust, 
foster even better collaboration and ultimately strengthening connections. So as I move forward, I'm also making a conscious effort to communicate more frequently, more openly and even when I don't have the answer because I've seen firsthand um, how much this matters. Not just for the clarity it brings but also for the trust and the understanding that it builds along the way. The next question, what can people look forward to next for the podcast and your ventures? Well, I'm excited to share a little bit on what's going on in this season of my life and also what I've been working on. So first up with the podcast, I'm planning also to build out different segments within the show itself. Uh, I want to bring on a variety and depth to more conversations, exploring new themes and perspectives that resonate with where we are in our journey. My hope is also that, you know, these segments will offer something different for everyone. A space where we can dive deeper into the topics that matter most to us. And, you know, in this season, I actually also introduced uh, versus season one, uh, conversations with inspiring everyday individuals around us. So, for example, this season we had the likes of Pet Law, Ashish Kumar, Karen Tay, Janice Koh, Waiki and... You know, the feedback on these conversations have been so encouraging uh, to also know that so many of you have so many takeaways from these brave and courageous and inspiring stories from these individuals. So I'll definitely be doing more of that as well. And beyond the podcast, I'm also working on expanding closer uh, where, you know, it's about me bringing all of us closer together in person whether is it for workshops, events and this has been also such a meaningful part of our community. You know, what I really enjoy is also coming together, getting together to support each other, learn from one another and to also learn from inspiring speakers. These in-person gatherings have also shown me just how powerful it is when we come together, how much we can grow, how much we can learn and support each other when we're all in the same room. I'm also committed to creating more of these opportunities for us to connect face to face, to share our stories and to inspire one another as we navigate our individual paths. As for Love Bonito, you know, I think this season is also um, if I may be honest, a pretty challenging one and that's why I've also had to put some of my personal plans on hold to really also spend more time uh, in certain aspects of the business. And that's not all. I'm also working on the new version of the I Am Well journal with Crystal and we can't wait to share more about that with you soon. This journal has really been a personal project close to our hearts and we're so excited to be able to bring an even more refined and meaningful version to life soon. So, you know, in summary, I think through it all, whether it's the podcast, um, Closer uh, and Love Bonito, I think my goal is to continue to push forward, uh, to keep learning and to keep building a life that reflects my deepest values. And of course, you know, if you have any feedback or suggestions on anything at all, be it the podcast, uh, Love Bonito, I Am Well Journal, Closer Events, please feel free to send them my way. It'll mean so much to me to uh, hear from you, to hear, you know, what you've been enjoying and also hear areas that you think, you know, we can improve on. Okay, and the next question is, what words of encouragement do you have for those of us who are feeling stuck or struggling with finding who we are? Wow. If you're feeling stuck or uncertain about who you are, firstly, I want you to know that you're exactly where you're meant to be. This moment right now, with all its challenges, all its doubts, all its uncertainties is part of your journey. And it's easy to feel lost when things are not clear or when the path ahead seems overwhelming. But I've also come to realise that sometimes the most impactful growth uh, and the most meaningful growth happens in these very moments of discomfort. But here's the beautiful truth that I've learned too. While we are exactly where we are meant to be, we don't have to stay where we are if we don't want to. We have the power to move, to change the direction, to create a new path that aligns with who we want to become. 
it's easy to feel, I think, like, you know, we're stuck in a particular situation or mindset. And I actually believe that we're not trees. We can move, we can grow, and we can evolve. We can uproot ourselves and we can change direction. Life isn't about rushing to find the next thing or forcing change before we're ready. It's really, I think, about recognizing that we have the agency to make choices that serve us, to take steps, however small, that can lead us closer to our true selves. Sometimes that move might be a subtle shift in our perspectives or a decision to set a boundary or the courage to say no to something that no longer serves us. Other times, it may be a bold leap into the unknown, trusting that we'll land exactly where we need to be. So if you're feeling stuck, take a deep breath and remember that this is just one chapter in your story. You have the power to turn the page. You have the power to start a new chapter whenever you're ready. Keep moving forward, even if it's just one small step at a time and you'll find that you're exactly where you need to be to become who you're meant to be. So I also wanted to take some time to share with you some of the books that I'm reading and in particular these two books that I find myself uh, returning to and rereading and it's The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday and also The Courage to be Disliked and these two books have deeply influenced not just my thinking but also how I navigate life's challenges and I have read these two books a couple of years back, but during this season where it's been a little bit more challenging for me, I also found myself reaching out to them again. These books have become more than just reading materials for me. They've become the guides that I turn to when I need perspective, strength, and a reminder of what truly matters. So I'm going to share uh, a little bit about them with you. Uh, so let's start with The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. This book first came into my life during a time when I was feeling particularly overwhelmed by the challenges I was facing. You know, those moments where it feels like everything is piling up and you're not sure how to push through? That's exactly where I was. And then I stumbled upon this book and it completely shifted how I viewed the obstacles and challenges I was facing. The central message inspired by Stoic philosophy is that the obstacles that we face aren't just barriers or blockers. They actually are the very path to growth. And there's this powerful line from Marcus Aurelius that Ryan Holiday emphasizes. I'm just going to pull it up quickly. And it says, The impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. And this to me is such a simple yet profound idea that challenges in our lives aren't just things to overcome. They're actually the very things that shape us into who we're meant to be. And one of the most impactful lessons I've taken away from this book is the idea that there is no good or bad without us. There is only perception. There is the event itself and the story we tell ourselves about what it means. I'm going to repeat that. It was so powerful for me. There is no good or bad without us. There is only perception. There is the event itself and the story we tell ourselves about what it means. My takeaway was really that, you know, what, whatever happens is neutral. But whether it becomes positive or negative really depends on the story we tell ourselves about it. And this really resonated with me because it reminded me that the way we perceive our challenges or obstacles can either empower us or defeat us. It's not the event itself per se that defines us, but the story we choose to tell ourselves about it. And this perspective has been a game changer for me. The book is structured around three disciplines, perception, action and will that together form a framework for overcoming obstacles. So I'll just briefly run through them. The first discipline, perception, really teaches us to see things as they are without having our own emotional reactions or fears to it. It hit home for me because I realised how often I let my own fear 
or frustration cloud my judgment. But this book has really taught me to step back, to see things more clearly, and to also recognize that I have the power to shape my reality through the lens of my perception. And then there's the discipline of action. The second one, the idea that it's not just about thinking or planning, but actually doing, taking those steps forward, even when the path isn't necessarily clear. I've always been someone who would feel more secure if there is, you know, a plan in place. But as you and I also know that life doesn't always give us that luxury. Reading about the stories of people like Amelia Eckhart, who didn't wait for the perfect moment but took bold action anyway, really inspired me to stop waiting for everything to be perfect and to just start moving forward. I also realized that in my procrastination, it was actually um, rooted in fear. And this really also you know, opened up my eyes to see how I can confront those fears and take steps forward. It's something I remind myself every day, progress over perfection. And thirdly and finally, the discipline of will which is really all about resilience and inner strength. This part of the book really resonated with me deeply because I've had moments where I felt powerless against the circumstances that life threw at me. But in this book, you know, The Obstacle is the Way, uh, it reminded me that while we can't control everything that happens to us, we can control how we respond. It's really like what the quote says, life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we choose to respond. It's about cultivating that inner resilience, finding purpose even in the hardest of times and knowing that these challenges are what will make us stronger. So rereading this book, The Obstacle is the Way, has been like a conversation with a wise mentor. Each time I discover new layers of insight that apply to what I'm facing now and where I am in life right now. So if you're facing any challenges or seeking new perspective, I would highly, highly recommend this book. It's been an anchor for me and I believe it can offer you the same clarity and strength. Okay, on to the second book. So this book is The Courage to be Disliked by, I hope I don't butcher their names, uh, Ichiro Kishimi and Fumitake Koga. And I feel like, you know, maybe um, the title of this book doesn't really do it justice. So this book is called The Courage to be Disliked. And it has really impacted how I think about happiness, relationships, and also personal freedom. It's based on the teachings of Alfred Adler, a psychologist whose ideas challenge a lot of what we typically believe about self-acceptance, growth, and in finding happiness. What I love about this book is that it's presented in a very unique way. It's presented as a dialogue between a philosopher and a young man who is struggling with life. It feels very much to me like I'm eavesdropping on their conversation that's meant to push all of us to rethink our assumptions about life. For me, it's also been like sitting down with a wise sage uh, who challenges me to look at things from a completely different perspective. One of the key ideas that really struck me here is the notion that our past doesn't dictate our future. Adlerian psychology teaches us that we are not defined by our past experiences but by the meaning we choose to give them. So it's also a very similar vein to the book earlier, um, The Obstacle is the Way. This was also, you know, a shift for me because I also sometimes find myself um, spending a lot of time uh, wallowing and also reflecting on how my past has shaped who I am today. And this book challenges that by saying, no trauma, only perception. It's not the events themselves that hold power over us. It's the stories we create around those events. And again, you know, similar to um, The Obstacle is the Way, this has been incredibly freeing for me because I can choose to ask myself, you know, what story am I telling myself about this situation, about this circumstance that I'm in? 
is this story serving me or is this story holding me back? And I also realized that I have the power to reinterpret what has happened and choose a different path forward. Another concept that also really resonated with me in this book is the idea of gaining freedom through personal responsibility. The courage to be disliked also really talks a lot about something called the separation of tasks, which essentially means understanding what is within our control and what isn't. For example, how others perceive us is their task, not ours. This was a huge eye-opener for me. For so long, I would find myself worrying about what others thought, trying to meet their expectations, and also feeling weighed down by the need for approval. But this book really opened up my eyes and taught me that true freedom comes when we let go of the need for external validation and focusing on what we can control, which is our actions, our choices, our responses. There's also a quote from the book that I keep coming back to. It says, Your life is not something that someone gives you, but something you choose yourself, and you are the one who decides how you live. This speaks to the heart of you know, the book's message that we have the power to create our own happiness, but it requires courage. So if you're also like me, you're searching for a way to redefine how you approach life, to reframe you know, what you're going through as well, uh, I would highly, highly recommend this book because it's been an incredibly helpful guide uh, for me and I know that this will definitely offer you inspiration and courage. So once again, thank you so much uh, for being with me on this journey. Uh, it truly is a privilege to be able to journey with you, hear from you and learn from you as well. And please let me know if you have any feedback, suggestions, questions or anything at all. And I just really also hope that this episode has brought you some love and light. And I look forward to the next time where we sit down and really have another heart-to-heart -heart session. And this is me signing off now. I will see all of you soon. Bye!